I mentioned when we were learning about z-tests that z-tests are very uncommon because a z-test requires that we know the standard deviation of the population and it's very infrequent that we actually know that information. We need an alternative test, one that we can do in times when we do not know the standard deviation of the population and for that we would use a one-sample t-test. Well, what is a one-sample t-test? It is a parametric procedure that tests whether a sample mean is statistically significantly different than a population mean when the standard deviation of the population is unknown. So as we look at this example with the polar bears, there's a, a population of polar bears that walks an average of 100 miles per week. That is our population value. We've drawn a sample from that population which walks an average of 150 miles per week. And the standard deviation of that sample is 9. Well, that's important because we do not know the standard deviation of the population. We can estimate the standard deviation of the population using the standard deviation from the sample. However, when we do that, we have to adjust our sample size by 1, n minus 1 what we call degrees of freedom. That adjustment will allow us to use the standard deviation of the sample as an estimator. The assumptions for a one sample t-test are these. We have an independent and a dependent variable. Our independent variable is going to be the one sample. It's just the one group that we're using. Within that group, however, we want to be sure that we're measuring something. We're measuring height or weight or diameter, something that we can calculate a mean. Add up all the scores, divide by n, that gives us a mean. So we have our one sample as our independent variable, a measurement as our dependent variable, and then we want to be sure to check for some other assumptions that are built into this test. For instance, we want to be sure that there are no extreme outliers in our data set. We want to be sure that we don't have any missing data in our data set, and that the participants or the subjects in the data set were selected randomly, independent of each other, and that the scores of one person do not affect the scores of others in the sample. The last assumption is normality, and that is something we can check with our statistical software, whether that's Excel or JASP or SPSS or R. Important that we check these assumptions because if the assumptions have been violated, the conclusions that we draw from our data may not be accurate. There are certain settings that we want to know for every test. For the one sample Z test, the settings are these. The null hypothesis simply says that the sample mean equals the population mean. We would write this in symbols as H sub zero colon mu equals mu sub zero. But the mu sub zero is actually going to be a number. We're going to plug in the mean of the population where it says mu sub zero. The alternative hypothesis is h sub one colon mu does not equal mu sub zero. And again, we will plug in the mean of the population for the where it says mu sub zero plug in those numbers. The alpha level is typically set to 0 0.05. Our degrees of freedom for this type of test, n minus 1. The critical value is based upon the degrees of freedom and the alpha, in this case 0 0.05. We would then look up a particular critical value using student's t-distribution table. And I'll show you an example of that when we get to this part of the hypothesis testing. We're going to assume that we're using a 0.05 alpha level for a two-tailed test. There may be exceptions to that, but for our learning, that will be a safe assumption to make for these tests. So here is what we're going to measure. Here's the test that we're going to use. We read a story in Martha Stewart Correctional Quarterly that tells us that the national average score for women on a test of indoor gardening is 73, but there's no standard deviation. We want to know how men will score on this test. We sample a random selection of nine men and compare their sample mean of 66.56 to the population mean for women. 
The sample of men is assumed to be pulled from a population of men who have the same mean as the women. In other words, the population mean of 73. We sample nine men who generate a mean of 66.56. We'll start with a null hypothesis that the men's mean is 73, no different from the mean for women. And here's how we would walk through our five steps of hypothesis testing. Step number one, select the appropriate statistic. We have a single sample with a mean and a known population value. However, we do not know the standard deviation of the population. This is the setup for a one sample t-test. The null and alternative hypothesis for a one sample t-test will be null h sub zero colon mu equals 73. 73 is the mean for the population. I've plugged it in where formerly it said mu sub zero. The alternative hypothesis, h sub one colon, mu does not equal 73. The level of significance, we're gonna be using a two-tailed test at an alpha of 0 0.05 with eight degrees of freedom. There were nine men in our sample, n minus one, or nine minus one, gives us eight degrees of freedom. But to find the critical value, we need to go to student's t distribution table, which you have as part of your class notes, or you can find in the description, in the link in the description for this video. Here's a student's t distribution table. We're doing a two-tailed test. We'll be using the columns to the left. Degrees of freedom run down the very first column in bold, and so we could go down the degrees of freedom until we get to eight. For a two-tailed test, alpha of 0 0.05, that's a critical value of positive or negative 2.306. Now there's another way that you could calculate this critical value, and that is by using the effect size and t-test multi-tool that I've provided for you, again, as part of the class, or you can find that in the link in the description below for this video. Go to the table for two-tailed tests. And here you will find a table. We could scroll down this table looking for degrees of freedom, or we could save some time by using the blue box up in the upper right. We would simply plug in our degrees of freedom, not our sample size, but our degrees of freedom, n minus one, which is eight, at an alpha of 0 0.05, two-tailed test, critical value 2.306. And notice that you can change the alpha level, change it to a 0 0.01, and that will change your critical value. You could also change this to a one-tailed test. Any critical value could be determined with just these settings. We're going to do our one sample t-test using JASP. Let's open up the JASP program. It's important that we have our data set, which is the MarthaStewart.sav data set, on the desktop. If you do not have SPSS installed on your computer, you won't see the icon for this data set because it's an SPSS file, but JASP can still open this type of file regardless of whether you see the icon for the data set. Let's go to the main menu, open, computer, desktop. You'll find the Mar Martha Stewart.sav data set right there on the desktop. Click on it and then click open. JASP will open the data set and we're ready to get started with our one sample test. We'll go to the t-tests menu and under classical we'll choose one sample t-test. Now the first thing that might draw your attention is a bug that is known to the developers. They're working on this, it'll eventually be fixed. But it says that the effect size isn't going to work for us. We can't get Cohen's D yet. Uh, the calculation ignores the test value. So we'll just click to close that box. We'll skip the effect size for now, and we'll just do the rest of the test. So step one is let's move our data into the variables box. Now, we see the results for the t-test. However, it's something very important that we have to do. The test is comparing to a population value of zero. However, our population value is 73. We need to change the test value to 73. That's our population mean. 
Let's also do an assumptions check. We'll check for normality. That'll give us a new table. Under additional statistics, we'll get our location parameter, our location estimate, with a 95% confidence interval. We'll skip the effect size for now because of the bug. We'll get descriptive statistics, and we'll get descriptive plots. Because of progressive disclosure in JASP, the results appear as we click on these options. So now let's take a look at what we have and how we would interpret these findings to determine whether our test is statistically significant. We'll start with our normality check. It's called a Shapiro-Wilk test. With assumptions checks, it's important that, or we prefer that, the assumptions be non-significant. Remember, significance is about differences. We're testing with our assumptions check whether our data are different than the assumption. Well, that's not what we want. We want our data to meet those assumptions. If an assumptions check is non-significant, that means it's not different. That's exactly what we want. And in this case, the p-value of 0 0.60 means that our data are not different than the assumptions for this test. The descriptive statistics give us the n of 9, the mean for our sample, the standard deviation, the standard error. All of those descriptive statistics will be used for our write-up. And now we're going to interpret the test itself. Remember, there are three ways that we can determine statistical significance. The first is by checking the actual test value. In this case, a t-test, it's the t-value. The value is a negative 3.23. You remember that our critical value is 2.306. Our 3.2 exceeds the critical value of 2.3. The t-test is now in the region of rejection or in the critical region. Statistically significant. Let's also check our p-value. The p-value is 0 0.012. If we were to convert that to dollars and cents, it's a penny. That's less than 0 0.05. Our p-value less than 0 0.05, statistically significant. Let's check one more thing. That's our confidence interval. This is the confidence interval around the sample mean. The lower is 61.9, the upper is 71.1. That does not include the population value of 73. All of these findings tell us exactly the same thing, that our sample is statistically significantly different than our population we would reject the null hypothesis. That's the hypothesis that says there's no difference. If we reject the idea that there's no difference, we are saying that there is a difference, that the sample is statistically significantly different than the population. Here's how we would complete our five steps of hypothesis testing. For step number four, we have t with eight degrees of freedom equals a negative 3.23 probability of 0 0.012, and this tells us that men scored significantly lower than women on this test. Let's write up our findings in APA style. Here's how we would do that. A one-sample t-test was conducted to determine whether men score differently than women on a test of indoor gardening, a population with a mean of 73. The mean scores for men 66.56, standard deviation of 5.98, were significantly lower than for women. T with 8 degrees of freedom equals negative 3.23. Probability equals 0 0.012. If we had been able to calculate an effect size, we would have an effect size of a negative 1.08. And the 95% confidence interval, in this case I've written it for the confidence interval around the mean difference, but in either case it would be exactly uh, the same conclusion that these results are different. So this suggests a gender difference in gardening skills. I want to return to JASP for just a moment and show you how you would do this kind of test as a one-tailed test. It's really easy to do in JASP. In fact, as you look down where it says alternative hypothesis, you'll see we've been using an equal test value. Let's just change that to a less than test value. And now we're doing a one-tailed test. Look at our t-test results. You'll see that the sample mean is exactly the same, but the confidence interval is now a negative infinity to an upper value of 70.26. Our p-value is still very, very small, and our t 
score does not change at all. So that is how we would do a one-tailed test using JASP. We have another option here as well. We can also do a Z-test using JASP. All we have to do is change our test from student's T-test to a Z-test. We would deselect student if we wanted to not see the T-test, and we would just get our Z values, and those will appear in the same output box as did the T-test values. And that is how we would do our one sample t-test for our business statistics class. Next, we're going to look at how we can do hypothesis testing using proportions.